So I'm going to hand over now to uh, Anil Ali, who you saw earlier, who's going to uh, moderate the next panel. Over to you, Anil. Thanks, Steve. Okay, so we have a, a question here related to um, industry existing industry standards, uh, specifically IEC 61499 and IEC 61131. The question is, is, uh, is IEC 61499 a prerequisite for openness within industrial control, or is there a way to achieve openness with older, more widely adopted standards like IEC 61131? I'll answer that one. Um, you can definitely use 61131.6149 uh, is a build on 61131.6.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1
So the, the, I've, I remember reading this question in the in the uh, Q and A, and I forget it exactly. But um, the <clears throat> I've I've only uh, just started implementing an OPC UA product, and what I found helpful was uh, to have a little bit of a tutorial on OPC UA, and then the various stacks come with uh, like libraries for different languages. So uh, I'm using the C++ one. There's a .NET one, and there are Python ones, and uh, you know you can probably find Java ones and all kinds of things. But uh, I would say that you know if I didn't know C++ and I didn't know the standard template library in C++, I, I would be struggling quite a lot to integrate OPC UA into my product. Now on the flip side, maybe there's a question of uh, if you're going to use OPC UA, not so much implementing it, but use it in your plan, what do you need to know? And uh, I haven't done that, so I don't know the answer to that. But uh, I mean, certainly back in the olden days of OPC, but before UA, um, you know, there was a, a set of stuff that was really pretty important to know about how to set up the security and the passwords and that kind of thing. So does anybody have some experience on that side, the using side? Uh I'll add there, um, you know, the vendors' products are starting to implement OPC UA. Um, the use of OPC UA for me as an end user, I, I want to use it in the product. Um, so when it comes to actually, um, if, if programming or um, system development is necessary, I'd recommend uh, you find a good system integrator who has some experience and exposure to OPC UA. Uh, and is willing to work on the system and, and help you get it working right. Um, I, I think as more products become available and it becomes much more widespread than the OPC Classic, we'll start finding that uh, it works a lot of the same ways. Uh, it has more features, which is good. And since it uh, offers the ability to have the information model, which is in the standard for the OPAS, um, it is really the solution of the future. Um, I think as far as other technologies, the same issue exists. Um, depending on how sophisticated you are in your use of your equipment and engineering of that equipment, then it would determine whether you need systems integrator help, vendor support, or you're capable of dealing with most of it yourselves. Now, we'll say that the open standards approach of the OPAS is really important in that it's a lot easier to learn those open standards than it is to learn the proprietary methods of you know vendor X or vendor Y. And so that is that is my perspective as an end user of it is slightly different in that you have to learn the open standards at some point, but once you do, um, if you change vendors, you won't have to learn any new standards with open. I've got uh, one question that will change gears a little bit, um, but and then we can go back to probably more of a, uh, the, the technical aspects of the standard. But here's a question from uh, Stephen Stanford. DCS vendor business models are still predominantly product margin driven. Is this a barrier to adoption of OPA? Will the nature of contracts need to change? For example, away from product sales towards rewards for the delivery of benefits shared between buyer and suppliers? So I think this question more so speaks to uh, the, 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 the changes between actors within the business ecosystem. So would anyone like to, to take that one? So I think we certainly anticipate some changes in the business ecosystem, whether that will change to more of a. Uh, I, I like the I like the suggestion that the the, the uh, person suggested there, where you know instead of selling you a product, I'll sell you uh, I'll install a product and take a cut of your savings. You know that kind of a thing. Um, those those kind of metrics are difficult to define. I think. Um, but it's an interesting idea. So I d I don't know how the pricing and uh, delivery kind of mechanisms will shake out in the future. Uh, for example, we're talking a lot about separating hardware from software. 
in these products where today when you buy a rock wall animation controller you generally get software and hardware all together in one price and it's not really clear how much you're paying for either of those things and uh, so if we were going to develop a product where you could put anybody's software on our hardware then we would need to find a way to to price those separately and that might be a difficult problem um, so I, I think I can say with confidence that we don't really know how it's going to happen yet, but uh, we do expect something to change. I guess I'd, I'd be interested to hear if any of the audience has how they, you know, has a suggestion for how they'd like to see that market change. Yeah, or you know how they, you know, any predictions that they, you know, that that they have. Um, I'm sure you know with with that appeal, we'll we'll get uh, we'll get a couple. Um, I have. So, um, Anil, if I can just add to that, sure. right? I think, Go ahead. Um, yeah, following up on what Brandon had said about the, uh, you know, the whole digital transformation and the ability uh, of the systems, as well as Gene's comments on having flexibility, the move towards sort of the open standards in, is in some sense inevitable. It's a question of when it is going to happen and how fast it is going to happen. Right, I think it, we're in that uh, case. I think the the analogy to the software defined networking is also very appropriate. Where, you know, when when Cisco and others used to sell proprietary routers, and and you know, you were locked into that system, versus uh, yes. you know, after after SDN, uh, Cisco said, you know what, this is the new way this game is going, and they figured out how to change from proprietary um, network and routing to more of the selling services and, and more value added uh, companies, right? I think th that change is happening and it's happened in other industries. It is going to happen in this industry as well. So, and, and it's really, I think going back to this, this is not about putting suppliers, you know, disadvantaging suppliers or, or changing um, their, you know, it is going to change the mode of operation, but it's really about uh, eliminating the inefficiencies in the system, right? I mean, a, a, a particular supplier may have uh, relationships with existing, uh, you know, uh, their own existing suppliers, sub suppliers, and, you know, that doesn't necessarily allow you to get the best in class service or a product. And so I think this is all about eliminating those inefficiencies and creating value in, in the business model. Got a question here. Uh... Control systems are designed to last 20 to 30 years. Do you see this technology as a disruptor like IIoT, where end user organizations upgrade early to replace these systems? Or do you see this as a transitional technology that will take years to take hold? I, I see it as a disruption. And the reason is if you look across your automation system, the lifetime expected life, ex, you know, of this equipment and the pieces parts are different. Um, we know that wiring lasts many decades, instruments last decades, IO generally lasts a decade or two. Computers, well, you know, three to five years from now, we want a new one. Um, if you think about Moore's law, it is always progressing. If you think about the, the need and the demand for, for better software, new efficiencies, um, new optimizations that demand is going to come so when we start looking at what the you know opa is proposing in the standards is somewhat of a we start abstracting away uh, software from hardware and even in the hardware world maybe we abstract away io from compute and so if you think about it you might need a stronger computer you know in, in our desktops you, you imagine we, we don't need a new mouse um, in our automation systems, we might not need new analog input cards, but having a better computer is something that would be advantageous. Now, obviously, it's got to be a business justified. We're not going to trade them in every year, but the idea that somehow the computer technology from day today is going to be useful in 20 years, I 
I think we've actually learned that lesson and that making me hold this computer for you know 15 20 years makes me hold it way past its prime and and has impacted my ability to generate benefit my, for my company so i i think that in the brownfield world there will have to be a conversion and that will take some amount of time but i do believe the technology itself that opas represents is really a disruption and a, and a giant step change Steve, and that's that's a good question and i appreciate you asking it uh, I, I think from my perspective, the answer is yes, it'll take years for this to become the normal thing. So for sure, it's not going to happen overnight. But I also expect that although plants will be designed to run for 20 years, we hope to make upgrading the control system incrementally and easy enough that you don't wait 20 years. and and at the end of those 20 years, you have a thing that's completely junk. So what we're hoping is that every, you know, like Dave said, every time there's a significant technology change, like five years or so, that you'll start to pick apart little pieces of your system and upgrade those little pieces. And so instead of having these huge, huge upgrade events every 20 years, you might have a smaller upgrade event every five years, something like that. That's, that's kind of a, what we hope happens. So, you know, and those are, those are very good. So essentially what, what that would mean is that within a system that's installed, to, you know, last maybe 20 or 30 years that, you know, say you're wiring um, last two decades, your, your, your computing resources would not necessarily have to abide by the same kind of life cycle. You can update um, your computing resources more frequently. Um, and then, you know, some of the other components within your system, um, like the end devices or you know, your level controllers or your temperature transmitters or your wiring can can Their live kids. out there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Literally. They, they can live out their life. Yeah. Wire, wiring can last uh, 50 to 80 years. Easy. Um, <laughs> instruments depends on their useful life. Um, and they do every every piece of electronics has that. But the computing capability as the business evolves and the capabilities, you know, progress, technology advances, you know, that's the kind of thing. If, if we can turn this kind of 20 year upgrade into an evolution and it happens, you know, done by um, a maintenance technician um, and not by some uh, multi-year uh, large cost project. I mean, that is, that is the goal behind some of the standards activity, at least from the, you know, my company in ExxonMobil, we we look at that very, you know, very strong benefit down the road. If you can use standards, you can change the parts you need to change when the business says, let's make it better. And we can, we can uh, justify that expenditure. Yeah. The next question is, does this standard apply in the services industry? If yes, how can it be used in the process innovation or re-engineering phases. I, I think that that question is posed from a perspective of uh, you know maybe like brownfield, brownfield uh, asset kind of rework or upgrades, um, something something kind of probably more of that nature. I, you know, uh, I, I think the services industry, when we start talking about especially the conversation we had earlier about roles in the marketplace, um, if you have open standards based technology, then you don't have proprietary lockout, shall we say. Um, we know there are uh, suppliers of services that have specialized in various proprietary technologies and if you were to go to more of an open standard space, then everyone would be able to participate in that activity, not just develop some um, ability. I, I think that it allows for more innovation as well. <clears throat> and innovation is one of the key pieces of all this, that with open standards, you don't have to worry about, can the innovation work in somebody else's proprietary world? They're all open standards based. Um, you can start using it and it doesn't matter if your products were bought from vendor X or vendor Y. I think those are the pieces. And as far as services go, um, and so I, I liken this 
to the um, maybe the computer world, you know, back in the day where mainframes were the computers of choice, you could only get s support and service from the vendors that sold you those equipment. Um, and we look at today, you know, if you have a, a portable computer or a tablet, you know, you can um, get that kind of service from anywhere. Many people are capable of performing the services they need to do themselves. So I think that the marketplace will open up for the services. I think we have a, you know, OPAP has a liaison with the CSIA and specifically because we think they will play a critical piece in providing services for these um, open standards-based systems. Okay, I think we have one last question here. Can you talk about the differences between open standards, open systems, and open source software? And are there open source options for designing, executing, and managing the code on DCNs? Something synonymous to Java, piggybacking on David Ford's analogy. So that is a really great question, I think. And, um... I, th I think some of those questions are questions I had when I first started working with OPATH. And so I'll start by trying to talk a little bit about the three different kinds of openness. Uh, an open standard is one which anyone who wants to implement the standard is allowed to implement the standard uh, without, uh, I don't know if I want to say, without any restrictions on it or without you know, unreasonable restrictions on it, but there are some standards which you have to uh, license uh, the standard and pay a royalty to the people who invented the standard and that kind of thing. And and that's not what we have here. What we have is a standard which was collaboratively developed and is uh, available to anyone who wants to implement it. Uh, I, I guess I don't know a good example of one that's not open, but anyway. Uh, an open system is one in which any vendor can uh, install components that participate in that system. So if we think of maybe the difference between, uh, I'm going to say, a Macintosh and a PC, the Macintosh had, you know, you open it up, it has all Apple boards inside. The PC, you open it up and it could have any number of companies inside. And that's because the interfaces to the internals were defined in a standard. And uh, so then other companies came out with, with products that implemented that standard and they were able to work together. Um, similarly, they could write their own software and run it on that system. So an open system is one which allows various vendors to participate. And, and that, that uh, you know, there's a whole range of different ways you could participate. You could have access to the data inside. You could have the ability to run your own software. You could have the ability to uh, substitute in your hardware for some other hardware or to put your hardware beside other hardware. And so there are a number of different ways that you could participate in that openness. And you wouldn't necessarily participate in all of them. Um, and then third one was, are there open source open options? Source. So uh, I don't follow the open source community all that closely, but uh, the one I mentioned earlier, the there is an open source OPC implementation. I know that there are open source uh, PLC implementations. Uh, and... Uh, so I, I know there are some open source projects. I know there are open source communication stacks. Um, and, and maybe we should talk just briefly about what open source means, is that that's uh, a collaborative, co collaboratively developed implementation of a product where the, and what we would call the intellectual property is collaboratively developed. Um, and, and that's different than an open, system where in an open system I might allow other let's take my example where I have a controller a PLC 
I might make it so that other companies can access the data in that controller or that they can run their software programs in that controller, but I might not actually give them the operating system source or the, the schematics. And so uh, you know, I might consider that to be kind of my secret sauce in my company or where I can differentiate and make a better product. And so I'm not going to give that away to other people. Um, so that's that might be the distinction between an open source product mm -hmm. and an open system, if that's helpful. Yeah, we, we get asked those, that those three items, questions regularly within our company, because a lot of people think of open source as free. Um, the reality is open source, if you're really going to participate, you have to help support and help advance that open source uh, software. So it's not exactly free. Um, the software would obviously you know, be available um, if you wanted to use it. I, I think that there's a lot of uh, you know, misnomers about what open source can or can't do in terms of security and, um, and how well it might work. Uh, a lot of products are actually built on some open source um, building blocks. But in the end, you know, we need a marketplace. And what that means is that people will bring um, their IP and their ideas and be able to sell them and generate uh, economic value for the companies that they represent. And I think the open standards allows them to interoperate with other people so we can create these open systems. And that's really the big piece. Um, you know, I'm not against open source. I'm not an advocate that it should all be open source. I think that uh, especially with automation, it should all be tested and validated. And, and if open source can fill the bill, then great. Um, I'd rather open standards so that I can build an open system uh, and um, procure or get the products, whether they be software or hardware, from the vendor community. So it is definitely a question you have to put in your mind and, and others have to remember they're not the same thing. Open systems and open standards and open source are not the same thing. I have one final question. This is uh this is one that'll go back to OPC UA. Okay, it says if it's all based on OPC UA, why do we need OPAS? There's there's more to an automation system than just the uh, uh you know the communications and information model. So I, I took a swing at that in the chat and I yeah. sorry to interrupt Dave, but um, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> my, my main, I, I think that it's a good question. And the answer is, well, you know, maybe if we all agreed that OPC UA was the, the right thing to use, we wouldn't have this committee, you know, but, uh, but without OPAS, you know, before OPAS, we hadn't really just decided that OPC UA was the way a process control system should be architected. And then once we decided on OPC UA, there's quite a bit of work around um, how do you represent a particular thing in OPC UA. So uh, OPC UA is you know, fabulously flexible. And uh, so what we essentially did was constrain OPC UA to achieve higher interoperability between OPAS products. So what would be an example? Like one of the examples would be, uh, you know, we have to implement certain client ser server pro uh, client server profiles, and we represent our signals in a certain way, so that when you have two different products that are both talking about a signal, they can hook it up and and good things will happen. So I'm not saying that that wouldn't have happened if OPAS didn't exist. But it hasn't happened yet. So, uh, what OPAS tries to do is find these good underlying standards like OPC UA and then add some prescriptive text about how exactly to apply that standard to our domain. And, and in that way, to make the standard work uh, better for us and to achieve what we call our quality attributes, which you know, are. The, the big ones are things like interoperability and interchangeability and security and stuff like that. So that's uh, 
Yeah, and then I'll go to where Dave Debari was about to go, I think, which was there's more than communication here. Uh, we're, you know, OPC UA is our transport, uh, and we've defined our information models in OPC UA, but we also have uh, mechanisms for exchanging programs between various vendors. So there's an import export format, which OPC UA does not talk about. Uh, there's some offline representation stuff that's not an OPC UA. There's some physical platform definition that is not an OPC UA and uh, will be you know, even more uh, thoroughly defined in the future version. Uh, there's things like how to commission nodes or how to manage them and how to orchestrate them. That's, that's a, coming, a coming section in the spec. Uh, Anyway, so there, there are, there, the point is that the communication transports is one piece of the automation puzzle, but there are many others. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good answer, you know, essentially saying that the OPAS standard is going much farther than just, addri just addressing, uh, you know, the communication protocol or the communication, uh, communications between, you know, de devices and you know, on, on the system. Right. That is a big piece, but it's not the only piece. And that's why you can't just say, you know, use OPC UA and everything's, you know, that's all you need to do to do OPATH. It's much more as Dave put it. And all, this, all the parts have a, a component that can use and might rely on OPC UA, but there's other things that will not be OPC UA based just because of the nature of what they are. That's right, and well, you, you know, David, to take to take that a little bit further, there are already systems that are UA based um, that are implemented by you know different assets and end users, and and there are still shortcomings in those systems as well. So, um, the, the, you know, the well, you know, I guess you know to to kind of sum up what what David Ford said, uh, UA is not. Um, it, it doesn't completely solve the problem because you know there are existing standards that are, there are existing systems that are all UA based. So I think we've got uh, one last one here. It's um, no okay. All right, I think that that'll conclude oh, our Q and A there's session for today. Unless question. we have any, uh, yep. Oh, sorry, uh, I said that Patrick Simon asked a question. Is in it is. It is a OSI enterprise approach, OPC UA, all layers. Um, so I'm not quite sure I know what the question is. Um, yeah, so I don't know. Yeah. Do we want to talk at all about how the OSI model would I, apply here? You know, this is why this is why maybe the OPC UA is not the, um, is is not everything in the system. We have applications, automation, the automation you know, runtime application, it might communicate with its, uh, I'll call it its friends, the HMIs, the historians, the other controllers, if you will, um, with, you know, data using OPC UA, but actually an OPC UA is not running my PID algorithm that's controlling the level or flow. Um, the historian application isn't, you know, it, it may communicate and use the information models from OPC UA, but that's not the critical piece of what it's doing. Um, and so that's that's maybe the the part about the OPC UA. It, 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 it fills some very nice roles because it's got a lot of features, way more than the OPC Classic had. Um, but it's not the entire system. And so it's, I don't think it's the whole stack. Um, as far as the networking, I, I think that's where the comment may be being added. Um, there's a lot of what we call the OCF is based on OPC UA. Um, but we do have some things like Redfish and some other aspects that are not OPC UA for system management. Okay. Um, any last comments, David Ford and Mohan? I think we'll just uh, echo the uh, you know, call to read the standard, the version 2.1, and uh, you know, join 100 plus uh, of your friends and uh, you know, participate and contribute to the, uh, the development of the standard. And uh, pretty soon we're going to start seeing products and systems, uh, commercial deployments, and people starting to generate value from this.
I think, uh, you know, if you really want to get on the bandwagon, you know, now is the time. That's right. Good, good point, Mohan. And, you know, as you're reading through the 800 plus page pages of the specification, you know, I'll, uh, yeah, I, I'd, I'd recommend any any questions, queries, concerns, uh, or you know suggestions. You know, point all of those to uh, ogspecs at opengroup.org, and and that's uh, that's an email address that's managed by the forum, and we will see all questions, comments, and recommendations that that go to that email address. So highly recommend. You know, like Mohan said, get a copy of the standard, start reading, review it, and then please send feedback. Uh, to that address. And with that, I will turn it back to our host, Steve Nunn. Thanks, Anil, and thanks to all our, our, our panelists, um, uh, David Fort, David DeBarry, Mohan. It's uh, great to have you uh, uh, share your insights and answer those questions. So um, uh, some, some great stuff came up there. Thank you very much um, to everyone who asked a question. I hope you got them uh, answered to your satisfaction. And um, uh, thanks again to our to our speakers and panelists today. So that uh, largely concludes today's uh, activity. I hope you found it uh, useful and um, and enjoyable.